So hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us live from PCR London Vowels in London, UK. I'm Bernard Prendergast, a cardiologist based in the UK, and I'm very pleased to be joined uh, for this discussion by Chris Maduri from Sweden and João Cavalcante from the US, where we reflect on the journey in relation to transcatheter aortic valve implantation over the last 20 years and advances that can take us into a very bright and optimistic future. We all know that TAVI is now a very well established uh, treatment, a mature procedure for the treatment of aortic stenosis across the spectrum of surgical risk. And the question that faces us now is whether we can apply this technology to all patients. To do that, we will need to have durable devices, and we will need to have devices that mimic the native valve physiology before the onset of disease. And that is a significant bioengineering challenge that we're going to reflect on today. So Chris, if I can come to you first, 20 years in the game, we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of TAVI at this meeting. We've achieved a lot, but there's so much more that we need to do. What would you say are the major unmet needs and the challenges that we face? Bernard, I think that's a fantastic question. I think really nicely sets us up for, um, uh, you know, this conversation today. That uh, to date, we have done an incredible job of replacing a diseased valve. We have taken patients who have really struggling and replaced that valve, but we have not brought them back to their pre-disease state. And right now, you know, we've thought about really a, a field of trade-offs, so to speak, uh, between the different technologies that exist. And even though I don't think it's really the right way of fully thinking of them, they tend to sit in these buckets of balloon expandable and uh, self-expanding devices. And there's clear advantages and strengths of both of those, from balloon expandable having a shorter frame height and being easy to use, versus self-expanding having really probably more optimal hemodynamics and allows maybe easier commensurate alignment. But I do believe this is an opportunity in the area where Duravar really stands apart because I do believe it can actually provide both of the optimal uh, aspects of both balloonic self-expanding with the short frame height, uh, ease of use device, because it is balloon expandable. But because of its unique design, it allows for optimal hemodynamic performance as well as effective commissure alignment. But the exciting thing, as you've alluded to nicely, of bringing people to pre-disease state is it has a much more native lethal design than any other transcatheter valve or other surgical valves that exist. And has a unique tissue, uh, this advanced kind of acellular tissue that we think will continue to add in the durability story. But I think what's also perhaps almost equally exciting is that because of this unique design, it is like the valve that God's given us that we have much more native-like flow. And we think because of that, lower immunogenicity, which potentially impacts durability. Now, you know, how does this valve, what is this valve like? What is this actually unique about this? Well, we're going to go in a second, actually, I think, to the unique shaping of it. But uh, it's built on the backbone of a, this ADAPT tissue technology. It's been used now in over 30,000 patients worldwide with over 10 years of data and really remarkable uh, lack of calcification across that. Again, it's a balloon expandable platform, but it's unique because of its very large upper cell design, which allow, facilitates much easier coronary access typical pair of outer leak skirt, a very effective delivery system allows commissural alignment, and additionally has, uh, very importantly, this unique single piece of tissue. And I, I want to sit on this for a second because I think this is often where we get lost and what really differentiates this from being kind of the typical uh, three-piece valve kind of look at way of looking at things and almost this other section of patients almost, or, or valve types, which is this single-piece valve. And it's almost a whole different category of valves. And I think Joao will talk about this more of how many unique features happen because of this. But what happens is every other surgical valve or transcatheter valve is three pieces of tissue. They're cut into pieces. And because of that, we're constrained by sutures and other things that really impact that function. But if you look at the native human aortic valve, that's not how it works. It's a single piece that's shaped into this function. And what we see here is that actually this single piece of tissue is molded to mimic how the native human aortic valve works. And we believe there are real significant clinical implications to that. As you can see, just how much more natural this looks, how it allows it to open and close differently, and how it mimics that natural look. 
Additionally, we see that that has implications for coaptation, uh, for just the ability to open, and many other things that Joao is going to talk about in a little bit here. So uh, I, the Duravar, I think, really allows us to have a potential answer from after these last 20 years uh, to provide that true pre-disease state uh, for treating patients with severe aortic stenosis. Chris, this all sounds fantastic. And I want to turn to Zhao now. I mean, Zhao, you're a very experienced clinician. You have access to imaging every day of your working life with echocardiography, with MRI, CT as well, I'm sure. The question really is, what's, what are the limitations of current surgical and transcatheter valves? And how might a uniquely shaped device like this make a clinical difference? Oh, thank you so much, Bernard. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, it's quite a, a challenging um, you know, fork that we are at the crossroads now, right? We deliver this well, but the scrutiny will continue to be high for us to keep integrated and doing better. And I think, you know, the discoveries that we have uh, been uh, doing this along with Chris and the team from Duravar are quite interesting because it comes as in science serendipities it's, and things that we believe that we have to demonstrate what he has just shown in the cartoon. Can we see this on a bench topic? Can we see this clinically? And if we can, I think we're going to be into something different. that differentiates us not only at this media time point, but I believe also will make a difference to the patients, to the ventricle, and to the arteries. So aortic stenosis is not just a disease of the valve, but all of those components. So when we look at the valve, though, and we see competitors, this is work done by Janar uh, here at, in Minneapolis, uh, looking at this bench top with the 21 millimeter round fixture. Far left, you see Sapien device. You see that that valve opens. It still has some limited opening difficulties at the commissures. It billows. It creates this sort of a doming. It loses some of the EOA and the gradients are a little bit higher. You can see on the very far out uh, right, uh, the Evolute valve, super annular valve, that has this fluttering. is somewhat of a redundant leaflets. Gradients are smaller, lower than the, the, the balloon expandable, but it still has this redundancy of the leaflets. You can see with the Duravar and that diagram that, you, that Chris has shown, because of this unique uh, single tissue, uh, we have a capability to open this valve very wide open at the very low gradients, at a very low pressure. So it's almost like you, you have a activation of like automatic doors. As soon as you step in, it automatically do, the doors open to you with a very low pressure. So this might be quite beneficial for ventricles that are suffering to unload this. Now that's demonstrated on a bench top and you can see here side by side comparison. Yes, opening of the balloon expendable is favorable, but you still lose some real estate. And I believe that any single piece, that the, the lack of inadequate washout, this might create a harbor. This might be a potential nidus for lack of washout and potentially leaflet degeneration over, over time. This much greater opening in larger UAI, now as showing on the bench top, can we see this clinically? And I would be curious to hear what Chris has to say to us on the first experience also in humans. So fantastic, Zhao. And these in vitro experiments that we're seeing here on FAS are, are truly fascinating and a real sort of insight into the hemodynamic function of these existing and potentially futuristic valves. But Chris, you know, whether it's cars, aeroplanes or medical devices, we know that there are new technologies that promise a lot, but when it comes to reality, they, they don't deliver. So what have we learned so far from the, the early human experience with this device? Absolutely. And that's a really well said, Bernard. I think, uh, as you'll see here, that it really does appear to be a technology that delivers. And we've now treated 13 patients to date. Uh, this is a single uh, non-randomized single arm study uh, evaluating the efficacy of this. And, you know, standard risk patients, I think what's important to understand as we look at the hemodynamic function here is these were small annuli patients that we treated. And it wasn't just small annuli, but it was actually very complex anatomy. If you look at the images below, these are not patients that are going into transcatheter aortic valve trials for the most part. These are really tough anatomies. Um, but despite that, actually, um, we had incredibly effective results. Treated 13 patients now with 100% procedural success. 
You can see in the left image there the ease of rotation of the device, as we saw with the delivery system earlier, for effective commensurate alignment. You also see that uh, this is a balloon XML platform. It's very easy to go up and down, as we've seen before, balloon expansion. These are easy to implant technologies. Uh, by our last case, we did, I think, the case in 26 or 27 minutes. Um, and additionally, from our first patient on, what you notice on this TE image is that it truly functions uniquely. These leaflets are not what we see when we look at surgical or transcatheter valves typically. This is what it looks like when you actually look at a native human aortic valve uh, that's healthy. With a mean coaptation length of 8.3 and leaflets opening all the way open to the very edges. Additionally, uh, all the way out to 30 days, no death, no stroke, no bleeding complications, really no significant issues. We had uh, one patient required a pacemaker out of 13, but that was a very high risk pacemaker uh, risk patient with the right bundle and left anterior fascicular block. So all these things have been very encouraging. But, you know, obviously it's nice to see that the patients can be treated safely, but the important thing is what are the actually data and the results? And honestly, quite frankly, we have not seen hemodynamic device, uh, results like this with other transcatheter valves. With annuluses under 23, uh, we saw mean EOA at 2, uh, index EOA of 1.15. If you were to benchmark this against the equally sized match sapien, that would be around 145 and an equally matched evolute, probably about 179, 18. So these are really uh, what we saw on the bench that Joao just showed us. This translated clinically, and I think that's important. This isn't a theoretical thing, but something we're actually have seen on the bench and with real good basic science, we're seeing now actually in the clinical results. Also, dimensionless index, mean gradient, really encouraging. So really uh, exciting, I think, early human results. And Zhao, just quickly, were, were there any further insights from either pre, peri, or post procedural imaging? Yes, very much so. So we had the luxury to obtain not only those uh, transesophageal echocardiographic views, as you can see, as you march through the pulse wave Doppler, there is continuation of that laminar flow. The peak velocity, the Vmax, is at the centroid of the artery, which is actually what you want. You don't want an acceleration because of the great opening of those leaflets. You can see that there is no acceleration as you cut across from the ventricle all the way to the proximal aorta. On the far right image, you can see nice commissure alignment, no halt. And this is for actually a very relatively small annulus, but you can see a nice accommodation of potential treatment in the future for these patients. In addition to our surprise too, and this is what is fascinating because as we come and continue to talk about that it's just not a disease of the valve, but also that unloading, that favor with larger way and a very low gradients, what we saw also was restoration of anemia flow. So let me take you through some images, and this is great collaboration with Pankash Garg as well, who has been helping us out to better understand. Patient with severe AS, the valve is stenotic. The flow is not at the center of the vessel. You can see in systole, it goes eccentric and it hits the wall. Well, that sometimes might not be completely restored when we replace this valve with not only surgical devices, but also with transcatheter devices. And what we could see is that with the far right image here, post Duravar, with the same MRI 2D flow, you can see a column of blood centrally and not having significant displacement of that flow. That is favorable. That is going to be favorable too. And when you look at comparison with multiple other devices, on the top left, you can see healthy valve, centroid flow, no stenosis, very similar to what you see on the top right with the Duravar. The other devices, unfortunately, did not get the same impact of that restoration of the laminar flow with continuation of the flow displacement. Could this be important? I think time will tell. We believe so. We believe that this restoration of a much more physiologic and native aortic valve flow profile would be good for the ventricle and for the arteries. And of course, Shrao, the, the golden bullet, the nirvana, if you will, would be if these hemodynamic changes translate into improved durability. And that, of course, will be a very important question for the younger low-risk patients who we are increasingly treating. Very, very much so. And I think we're going to be following these patients all along. We have had the chance to look at the 30 days and now looking at one year as well. Uh, we haven't seen any signal that is concerning. Again, in a very difficult anatomy and patient selection. I think we are just at the great beginning. And obviously, we're going to continue to learn much more. 
So there you have it. There are many who would say that Tavi is a done deal. There are many who would say that Tavi is boring. <laughs> but I hope we've persuaded you in the last 15 minutes that there are new developments in the field that will genuinely translate into major benefits for our patients. Thanks very much for joining us.